Yep. Right there. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm finishing my 14th year at Microsoft. I came here on a handshake with Bill Gates almost 14 years ago, basically to do startups within the company. And I've partnered closely with Bill for all that time. And I think we've made great progress. Many of the things that you've seen talked about by the people up to this point in the program are really built on many of the decisions that were made, the investments that were made many, many years ago. To some extent, my job at Microsoft now, particularly as, as Bill transitions uh, to the foundation over the next two years, is to ensure that, as Kevin said, the company has the ability to convert strategy uh, into business results through great execution. That really takes two parts. You have to have some strategy, and you have to have great execution. The people that have talked so far today are the people who really focus on what I think of as the more forecastable part of the business. And when we sit here today at a financial analyst meeting, I think, of course, the natural tendency is to try to analyze Microsoft. To some extent, my job and, and Bill's job, as Steve mentioned this morning, for many years has been to ensure that there's at least a component of the company that's looking out into the unforecastable future. And there are many reasons that I think that's important. And there are many reasons that it's actually difficult in order to uh, operate reliably in that space. We are in a technology-driven business that has perhaps the highest rate of change that, that history has ever known. We are operating in a time where the globalization of our uh, economy is changing things in ways that most businesses have historically never had to deal with, or certainly not at this rate of change. And so Microsoft has, as a company, uh, had a heritage of thinking about the long cycle innovation. And what I'd like to do is share with you the way we think about this long cycle innovation and why without it, I think it would be unlikely that you or your successors would be sitting in this room or think it important to sit in this room 10 or 15 years from today. But my job uh, and, and uh, that of the research organization and some of the other advanced development people in the company is to ensure that, in fact, it is important for you to be in this room 10 or 15 years from today. Big changes take time and effort. We all grew up in an era where consumer electronics or just electronics uh, were one of the things that really drove changes in our society. And many big business franchises were built around them. But it's often easy to lose sight in retrospect of how long it takes to build up some of these franchises. If you look even at these individual devices uh, in the uh, consumer electronics space, analog color TV transition took quite a few years and eventually reaches uh, saturation in the U.S. These are all U.S. curves. Uh, VCRs grew a little more quickly. Uh, DVD players have been among the, the most rapid uh, to move forward, but they were building on the foundation of these previous devices and experiences. And now high definition television is turning past the knee of the curve and, and growing quite quickly. The, in the computing space, we see a similar pattern. Uh, if you look at the growth of the personal computer from 1984 to the present, you know, it's been on a fairly slow ramp uh, in terms of, uh, a very long ramp in terms of getting to 70% penetration. And many of the things that we're doing are really taking computing beyond the personal computer and, and creating an environment where people will compute. They just won't do it in the confines of what we historically thought of as only the personal computer. The Internet, while its technologies actually date from the mid-70s, really began its commercialization in around the mid-1990s. And even that has taken quite a while to grow and, and now uh, asymptotically approach the penetration of the personal computer. Broadband as an improvement over that uh, uh, is like the uh, DVD player riding on the back of that installed base and growing quite quickly. When you look back at the history of Microsoft, I think people forget how long it actually took us, even in what you today think of as our big established franchises, to get where we got. Windows took us 10 years and four releases before it outsold standalone MS-DOS. Office, the original you know, word processor, now part of Office, took 11 years and nine releases before it was the best-selling word processor. Excel took 10 years and five releases to become the best-selling spreadsheet. So it's, it's 
easy to think we had these franchises forever, but in fact the company competed against people who had brought some of these products forward, but perhaps didn't mature them or evolve them in a, in a way that allowed them to sustain their franchise. So for many years, the company has, in my view, been systematically working toward our vision. When I came here in 1992 and Bill and Nathan and Mirabold and I sat around and talked about what did we think was going to happen in computing, it seemed quite obvious to us that the microprocessor would find its way into a lot of other devices and that would create a requirement for software. And very rapidly, uh, by 1994, we were in working on interactive television. Uh, we had done, uh, started the work which was the first uh, watch we did with Timex. We did the first joint game console that we were involved in with Sega. Uh, many of these things that we tried where we learned uh, were a key to our ability ultimately to, I think, prevail in these markets. But it's easy to lose sight of the fact that it was 10, 12, even 14 years ago that some of these things began. Robbie talked to you today about IPTV. IPTV is a, a direct derivative of the work we started in 1993 around interactive television. Back then, most people thought the network underneath it was going to be an ATM network, not a, an a packet, an, uh, IP packet switching network. Uh, but we evolved that. We were able to take our research results and the work that we had in the personal computer space and morph the fundamental ideas we had around interactive television into the set-top box and end-to-end -end service offerings that we're now selling and believe we will be the world leader in interactive television. We laid out a strategy in, in the mid-1990s that said we believe that ultimately people will benefit the most when all of these devices get smart and they get together and they work together. And this was at a time before the Internet had become the phenomenon we know today, before we had search engines or the level of mobility that we all uh, know and expect today. But we knew then that these would be important, and we set out a strategy. And that strategy said we're going to try to compete against, in, in, in almost every case, substantial incumbent companies, and we're going to try to get those devices to be smart, run software, and we want to be a player in every one of those markets. And today, years later, despite many people scoffing at our entries in phones and PDAs and other things, today in pocket computers and smartphones and other things, Microsoft is clearly a player. And I think our ability under Ray's guidance to now integrate these in conjunction with the live services is the ultimate manifestation of a, of a specific strategy that we outlined in 1994 and 1995. So each of these things has morphed. On this slide, you can see some of our first attempts, the first uh, handheld computer we did, uh, Web TV, which became MSN TV, and that's a picture of the first auto PC, which I, uh, we brought to market in the late 1990s. Today, there are a lot of companies that are building their cars using our embedded platform. Uh, most people don't even know about it, but indeed we have the capability to bring those cars into this ecosystem much more readily than people might expect. So today we have momentum. Robbie talked the media, about the media center. It's now become uh, shipping at a rate of about a million units a month. And it's more than 50% of all retail desktop PCs in the United States are the media center edition. That's a really transformational thing. It means when people get out of the store and they think they want to buy a computer, they now expect and demand that it has all of these additional capabilities. If you look back at, uh, as far as 1995, the first thing we did when we started to approach the mobility marketplaces, that was the, the heyday of the pager. And we worked on a data pager manager. Then we did Windows CE handhelds and ultimately the pocket PCs and the smartphones. And today, as, as I think Robbie mentioned, the, our phone devices are, are passing that knee of the curve. They're turning up. The business is becoming profitable. But like was the case with word processors and spreadsheets, it actually takes a long and sustained investment and the ability to adapt to the changes in the marketplace. So when it comes to sustained investment, you know, we're pretty much in our industry now king of the hill. If you look back over the time period just since uh, year 2000 and you accumulate R&D investment against uh, leading companies, certainly in our industry, some of the newcomers, uh, people like Sony who had the traditional franchises in many of these spaces with the consumer, uh, even though many of them are spending that to, to, to refresh on an annual cycle their hardware components, you know, I think we get a more accretive uh, effect from our investment in software research and development. 
and we are outspending and are certainly now globally competitive with anybody in the world in any field in our rate of the development of intellectual property. It's these investments that I think are really critical to the company's ability to, sp to spread out. Uh, and in fact, a key component of our ability to spread out can, is based on our ability to get the best people. For many, many years, we were a global recruiter of the best talent, and we brought it all to the United States. But eventually, we began to realize our appetite for the people was greater than we could get in, particularly given the, the regulatory changes on visas here. But we also recognized that our clientele was becoming uh, culturally more diverse and certainly geographically more diverse. And as Kevin said today, I think it's 251 countries, people are actively buying and using our technology. And so we've gradually built up our global research and development capability. This slide, the green dots, show where we actually have pure research facilities. And in this transition with Bill, uh, to, to me and Ray, I have now taken on formal responsibility for all of those uh, green dots. The red dots are where the company has significant uh, development activities. These are essentially under the province of each of the business groups that you heard the presidents talk about today. And in combination, it gives us the ability to do research and development essentially around the clock and across uh, all the major geographies. And we expect we'll have to continue to grow this over time, but certainly our, our reach in terms of the access to people and our ability to be uh, in and among the cultures in which we expect to deliver these products is really quite good. When you think of these innovations, and, and we talk about that word a lot, uh, as do other people, I think it's important to realize that not all innovation is created equal. Change creates opportunities for new products. Those changes can come in a variety of ways. They can come due to the change in the marketplace dynamics. They can change some underlying technology that was unexpected. And I think it becomes very, very important to think about how we create uh, uh, capability to deal with those changes or opportunities. And I put them in two buckets. I think of disruptive uh, innovations and responsive innovation. And it's Microsoft's ability to do both of these things, along with a third category, which I think of as sustaining innovation, that really allows the company's continuing this success to not be an accident. It is something that comes from diligent prosecution of strategies over very long periods of time and sustained investment in all three categories. Let me give you an example of why I think it's important to have muscles developed in, in each of these spaces. Uh, obviously, in the sustaining category, we're sitting here talking about uh, what we think are revolutionary versions of Office and Windows. And even though you could say they sort of do the things that the prior versions do, they really reflect deep research, for example, in the new UI of Office, to bring the capabilities of these products to the fore in a much more recognizable way or, or easily exposed way, thereby addressing the need of, of getting an ever larger audience to be able to get benefit from these capabilities in a world where they have less and less access to training. Uh, responsive is really critical. We clearly are not always going to anticipate every uh, technological advance. We're not going to have every great idea. And the real question is, are we able to bring our assets forward in a timely way to respond to those in, uh, events that really could otherwise disrupt the company? And I think our track record is pretty good. If you actually look at game machines, you know, we started uh, playing in this space, pardon the pun, uh, quite a few years ago. We tried a variety of ways to enter the business. And then eventually we decided that for, for uh, a number of factors, we had to actually get in, have a branded console, and we need to engineer a new computer, the entire operating environment for it, the tool chain for it, and bring it to market. And we were able to harness from across the company the talent and the, the research assets in order to bring that forward. But to some extent, if all we did was Xbox uh, and, and we were anteing up against the PlayStation and, and its incumbency and that of Nintendo and Sega, you know, one could argue it would be uh, almost a fool's errand to, to go into that very expensive business. And we knew that really we had to up the ante. And if you look at the left side of this chart, we did Xbox Live. We did it in the first product. We made the assumption that, that everybody would ultimately have broadband connectivity and that that would ultimately revolutionize the gaming experience. And so it was our ability to, to bring forward in the gaming industry a disruptive innovation in the form of the live service for Xbox. 
and deliver it in conjunction with the responsive innovation in the form of Xbox itself in order to position us now through great execution to have a, you know, what we think will be a 10 million unit lead in the next generation. Another thing people don't realize is that we, we had a disruptive strategy in the tool chain for gaming. And in the first generation, that was largely invisible. But as the machine complexities have continued to grow, that tool chain is going to be another invisible differentiator in the, in the world of uh, high-performance gaming. And the coupling of that to the traditional PC gaming community that Robbie talked about earlier really becomes a sustaining innovation uh, as we move forward. And so in, in each category, the company has looked not to just replicate other ideas that, that people have brought forward or new markets that present themselves, but we always look into our, into our uh, back pocket full of research assets and great people to come forward with something that we think does up the ante, not just ante up. But we always do it recognizing how long it takes to change these things because the scale of Microsoft and the scale uh, at which the technologies are used really has, has caused us to, to think very carefully about how long it takes for these things to become great global sustainable franchises. Let me talk now through, through a few demos uh, of ways in which we think we're going to be able to both ante up and up the ante in some areas that people are clearly interested in. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about enabling new ways to search and browse. Uh, browsing, of course, everybody's familiar with. It's now moving from the desktop to, to a more mobile environment. Uh, searching is something that everybody is uh, clearly uh, aware of. And, and I want to talk about how the community is going to continue to add things beyond the web pages that people know today and how we can disruptively change the way people think that they gain access to this. So uh, we have a, a piece of work that's been done in our research uh, lab in Asia, and we call it Photo to Search. Everybody's carrying around a cell phone today, and every cell phone virtually has a, a, a camera on it. And today, you know, you think about search, you think about the little white box, and you type some words in it, and you see what comes back. And so you put in words, you get back words, but in fact there's increasing interest in things in photos, videos, maps, and other forms of information that also provide a lot of potential utility. The challenge is, how do you type in the little white box the description of the thing that you really want to know? It's very, very hard. So they set about to say, well, could we actually use software and computer intelligence, in the case of photos, to be able to do what humans do? Recognize that photo and use it as a matching criteria. And so uh, the team has actually done that. You can take a picture of a unique, for example, building. We can uh, look at that building and develop a, a mathematical representation of the patterns. Uh, and then we can essentially put that in as a match to a universe of photographs that have been similarly characterized by the machine. And that gives us the ability to say, well, if I, where am I? If I'm lost, I'm a tourist in Japan or China, you can take a picture of a, a landmark building, and having done that, do a search on the building, it'll come back and say, I know where that building is, and then, then it can, for example, give you a map and say, okay, this is where you are, or this is the things that might be around you. So you didn't do anything by typing a text box. You didn't have to know where you were. You might not even be able to read the street signs, but in fact, you could convert your cell phone picture-taking capability into a useful piece of information with literally a few pushes of the button. We think that these kind of technologies can be disruptive in terms of what people come to expect or demand out of their search engine capabilities. Uh, what I'd like to do now is have Blaise Aguirre-Arcas come out. He's an architect who joined our live labs group through an acquisition earlier this year. Blaise, great to see you. Thanks. And what I want to show you is that while we do long cycle innovation, we really are also focused on how we can take uh, great technologies and blend them together with these things we've developed over a much longer period of time through our research assets in order to develop very, very compelling products. And as part of the live capability, be able to accelerate their availability in the marketplace so that they, they complement the uh, long cycle delivery platforms that we've got in the, in, the, in the case of the PC or Office or the basic Windows mobile technologies or even television technologies. It allows us to add value on top of those things on a much more accelerated basis. 
So Blaze, let's uh, let's talk about what you've got going here. Well, so what, um, what, what, what is the, that big dot they see? What we've got on the screen now is is uh, uh, is our our dowry. So. This is, uh, this is some technology that, uh, that I brought to Microsoft from, uh, from my startup, it was just acquired um, uh, at, the, at the end of 2005. And uh, so this is SeaDragon technology. It's a method for uh, interacting with, uh, with very large volumes of visual information very rapidly. Um, so these are, these are uh, mostly cell phone pictures, although we have a few here that are, um, that are really large, like this, this map, which is in the, in the kind of 100 megapixel range. Uh, this, is, this is an experience that one can, one can have over an ordinary uh, broadband or even narrowband connection. A, a thin DSL pipe can do this. So this is some technology that allows us to take essentially pictures of any size from something you take as a low res, and res picture of your cell phone to something that is in fact entire documents that are represented as a single image of ultimately the resolution necessary to read. Anything. I think you're going to show them one of those now. Right. So, well, this, this is actually another, another document type. Um, now, which is uh, this is all of Bleak House, um, the entire the entire book. Every column is a chapter, and you can see this is not an image. This is real text. So this is this is the kind of technology that we expect is going to be really changing quite a number of things at, at Microsoft in the, in the coming years. We've we've actually done this on cell phones as well. So this is a new model of navigation. Uh, yeah, you, you know, you just zoom around in in a in a two dimensional space in this case. So what else do you think we can do with this? Well, uh, so a couple, of, a couple of months after the acquisition, and this is now only about four months ago, uh, we were, um, so our, our acquisition, I should, I should mention, was, was driven by, by technical fellow Gary Flake, who founded Live Labs, the idea of Live Labs being to, to really shorten the, the innovation cycle dramatically and to bring a lot of the interesting things happening in MSR very quickly to prototype into market. Right. So um, a couple of months after, after that uh, acquisition, I saw a, an amazing demo of, of some, some research at Microsoft uh, Research um, at TechFest, which is the, the, the fair for those things. Can we, can we roll the, the video? What, what, these, uh, what these guys have done is developed a system that, that allows you to take a bunch of images. In this case, these are images tagged Trevi Fountain. Uh, here they're mined from Flickr, so there are lots of... Um, Lots of cameras, lots of times of day, times of year. So Flickr, uh, Flickr's a website, has nothing to do with Microsoft, where people put their photos up there and they can, and then the community can tag them. So you can put it in and say it's Trevi Fountain. Somebody else can come along and say, oh, I know what that is, that's Trevi Fountain. And they're adding tags to these pictures. So here they basically took them and... Well, what, what, what they were able to do is figure out from those images alone uh, what the three-dimensional model was of the Trevi Fountain. That's what's, what's being shown on the screen now. And each of those triangles is the location of, of a particular camera. So they, they, you can simultaneously solve for the geometry of what, of what you're looking at as well as where every camera was. So even though no, none of those people knew each other, they, none of the pictures were taken at the same time or from the same place, right. we're so able to cell phone pictures, take them all up and, and make a 3D model of, the, of that fountain. Exactly. So, so what did that inspire you to do? Well, uh, of course, when I first saw this, well, the first thing I wanted to do was put it together with, with, uh, with our stuff. And uh, this is, uh, this is the, the result. This is only after a few, uh, uh, only after about four months of work, so you'll excuse me if it, uh, if it crashes. But um, this, is, um, this is a collection of images that have been, that have been synthesized together using that technology. Uh, these are a few hundred images of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome taken by one of our guys in, in Italy a few weeks ago. And, uh, so he just wandered around St. Peter's he wandered around, and took a bunch took, of pictures. Took a bunch of these pictures. What, uh, these, these white boxes are where those, where those pictures were, what those pictures were taken of. And uh, so let's zoom around. He went up to the top of the cupola, and here's that, here's that picture from above. He took these images from the top. And you can see that what, what's, what's happening here is that all of these images are being registered together uh, in, in 3D, and they give you an experience that's almost, um, almost game-like of, of moving around in this space. These, all of these, all of these are, are places where he stood and took shots in the, in the center and, and what that shot was taken of. We can move around from image to image in this way. So it's, a, it's sort of halfway between a, between a game and a, and a slideshow. So, so the 3D model, which was synthesized by the machine from all of the pictures, produces the navigation metaphor, and the Sea Dragon technology allows us to stream the entire collection of photos to you uh, just hooking them all together seamlessly, so you're operating within that 3D space. Exactly. So, so this is a this is a pretty interesting technology just for for collections of images like this. But where we really think this 
comes into its own is when one thinks about what, what can happen when we take this technology and deploy it at web scale, which, which we'll be doing. So this, this uh, technology with, with canned environments we'll be releasing as a technical preview in the fall. And uh, the scaling up to the web, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but um, the idea is that if we can incorporate this into, into the web crawler for images, then uh, we can build up organically a three-dimensional model of the entire world. And uh, those, that, that, that model is built entirely out of those photos in an unstructured way. It can incorporate um, everything from satellite and aerial photographs that gives you, that gives you uh, the, the sense of what cities look like from high above, down to street-level shots, down to close-ups. And uh, it's, it's one of those really revolutionary kind of uh, paradigm-shifting things. We believe that, that this can give you a, a new way of, uh, of interacting, new, not only with images, but with the information behind them. And a new way to get information and, and to discover things. That's fab fabulous. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much, Craig. So this is a case when I think of the search business, where Microsoft is certainly doing all the necessary work to go compete in the traditional notion of search. But in the fall, we'll actually put this preview out and people begin to play with it. And hopefully, maybe even by the end of the year, we'll actually have a production version of this running and we'll be able to allow people to come to, to, to our, our website or register their photos or just let, allow them to be crawled. And our ability to make 3D models uh, will allow a completely new metaphor for navigation and discovery. Somebody can send you a photo, you can click on a link, you can go to a website, and when you get there, you can look around. Uh, and we can annotate things within pictures with, uh, for example, links. They could be brands. They could be, you know, any, any variety of other kinds of information. And so I think when people realize that the community process can begin to function using this data type in order to create a new model of, of uh, collaboration and navigation, you know, we may see the kind of phenomena we've seen uh, with YouTube in the video case or uh, MySpaces uh, or Facebook where the power of the community really begins to function on a global basis. And we're creating some technology that I think will allow that to happen. So I also want to talk about innovation not just in a technological sense, but in the case of business models. Uh, there's a, a, an interesting challenge that I, I discovered and I think my colleagues realized a few years ago as we really began to focus on market expansion into the emerging economy countries. And one of those problems was that uh, while the, the, the demand for access and, and use of personal computers and our technology was extremely high, uh, as high as it is in the developed world, their ability to pay for it in some sense, or at least in the, the, the psychology of whether they could pay for it or not, is really quite different. In most cases, they don't have access to consumer credit. They don't have a level of savings that allows them to buy our products from us in the models that we historically used for 30 years in the rich world, uh, which was to pay an upfront fee for our software and uh, have a perpetual use license until we came up with another better version. And then you decide to make another purchase. These people said to us, look, you know, I'd really love to use Microsoft software, a lot of it, but you need to make it available to me more in the model that I use like with my cell phone. So we took that quite literally and said, well, how could we alter the combination of personal computer hardware, our software system, and the economic ecosystem that exists in these countries and come up with a new model to give them access? And so we started two years ago to design a new technology, uh, essentially a security uh, and metering technology that has now been licensed by Microsoft to a number of the computer manufacturers. We trialed this uh, a little more than a year ago in a variety of countries, and we made our first commercial launch and announced it uh, a couple of months ago uh, with Magazine Luiza, which is the largest retailer in Brazil. And, you know, as I said, you know, my, the world I operate in is the harder to forecast world. I think it's fascinating to look at this graph. The blue line is the steady growth line across Magazine Luiza's stores that has, you know, started, you know, long, long time ago and has been growing quite nicely. It's our traditional PC business. When we introduced this FlexGo technology, the pay-as-you-go technology, where people can pay for the use of our software uh, or pay for a partially uh, uh, subsidized personal computer system by pay-as-you-go technology, just like most of the people in the world use prepaid cards to buy cell phone time, they can now buy access to our technology, our software, on a pay-as-you-go basis using the same prepaid cards that they use on cell phones. But we didn't, we didn't displace our traditional business. We said, let's just offer this as a new way people can buy our technology. 
And you know that only happened two months ago, but here's the first eight weeks of sales data uh, from Magazine Louisa. And uh, PC sales are up 82% in eight weeks. And uh, you know, I find this quite fascinating because we know we have literally hundreds of millions of people around the world who either use our software and don't pay for it or who want to use our software and the only legitimate way they think they can gain access to it is to go down to an internet cafe. So even if you dream the dream of live services and ad supported models for consumers or more small businesses in the world running dynamics, if we can't find a way to make it available to them where it's financeable within their own environment, either personal, small business, or within the, the financial ecosystem they operate in, then you just don't get that acceleration. And so my dream has been, and I think we're starting to achieve it, the uh, global rollout of an alternative way for people in the lower demographic profiles globally to be able to get access to Microsoft technology. So here we're doing it on the simplest possible model, just time. You know, you buy a month of usage, or, or 100 hours of usage, and when it's over, if you've got enough money, you can recharge it, and if you can't, the machine ceases to function. And that, that cease to function is basically the way people control cell phones, where you don't, if you don't pay, you don't get calls. We never had a way to do that for computers before, and even the Internet doesn't provide that mechanism. So here we took some of our uh, technology and security, and we brought it forward to create a new business model, which I think will largely be completely additive uh, in these markets to that which we've always done. We also have looked uh, broadly at the question of how are people going to enter uh, into, the, into the use of computing in these emerging middle class environments and certainly in the case of the, the huge numbers of the rural poor in the world. And uh, many people, including us, have been looking at different ways to, to lower the cost of the device the FlexGo technology is a way not to lower the ultimate cost of the product, but to change the business offer to make it more approachable for people. But clearly one of the things that's just booming globally is the use of the phone, the cell phone. You can go to the poorest villages around the world these days and go to, to a family in a very poor environment, and you, you typically will find that there are two things that they have at least. They have a television, and now they have a cell phone. And the question is, as these cell phones have become increasingly powerful, in fact, today, as, as Ray said, the, the cell phone in his pocket not only was more powerful than you know, the supercomputers that he and I grew up programming in college, uh, they're frankly more powerful than most desktop computers that are deployed in the emerging economy countries today. Most of those are still running Windows 95 or Windows 98 class machines uh, for all the reasons I talked about a minute ago. And our ability to get these people and, and their entire families I'll say, you know, onto the on-ramp to larger scale or more powerful computing, I think is going to come through phones and televisions and, and other devices. So we've clearly been investing heavily to have a, a capability in the phone space, and, uh, but we've always been targeting it largely at the top of the pyramid. Uh, back in January, Bill Gates and I were at the World Economic Forum, and there was a lot of discussion about you know, uh, could we help the world, or was the world going to be helped by having really low-cost devices uh, like $100 laptops and other things? And, you know, our response at the time was, hey, we love the idea of having ultra-cheap computers and getting them in the hands of kids. But, you know, our offhand comment at the time was that he and I had been chatting about, but couldn't we actually use the cell phone and some of the infrastructure-like televisions that were out there in order to get this process started a lot sooner than would come from you know, any collective dream of, of putting new computers in the hands of all the children worldwide. And so we said, what about doing something like that? Well, we have a long history in this, going all the way back to our work with Web TV. And so I'm going to show you now a, a live demo of a prototype that some people who work with me at Microsoft have done. So this is not a product. It's not ready to go. Uh, but it, it starts with a, a cell phone, smartphone technology. We've worked with some people to make a very inexpensive chip that will actually drive video out. And you could take, for example, a Bluetooth-enabled uh, mouse, uh, a portable keyboard like this, or you could use even less expensive wired ones. And by bringing these things together, uh, what you're actually looking projected at on the screen is the output of this phone. And it's output as standard television signals, and then we've converted it 
uh, for you to see on this screen. So here you're looking at the web TV technology, which ran on Windows CE, put into a cell phone in an experiment to say, could this be your first computer? And if it was, you know, what could you, could, could you do with it? Uh, so, well, one thing we, I can do, I can open and read email. And so here's the mail to me. I'll open this. Uh, here's got a Word doc attached. I can open up the Word doc. I can read the Word doc. I could uh, change the zoom factor on the Word doc. You know, I could edit this. I could save it. I could send it back. Basically, I've got the full capability of what we call our pocket office suite on this phone. By moving you beyond the ability to just work on the little phone, using the keyboard, using the mouse, and putting it on a larger display, for at least simplified applications, it's harder to distinguish this from a computer. Uh, and so we think that that gives us some interesting opportunities. So let me show you some other things we can we could potentially do with this. Um, I can cruise the internet. I could use it for the search I talked about earlier, but you know, here, uh, maybe I'll say, uh, let's look for a Starbucks nearby. You know, search. And it goes out to the Internet. Because this phone not only has a cellular connection, it's got a Wi-Fi connection. So we're connected to the Wi-Fi network here. Uh, it says, okay, here's a Starbucks uh, 1.16 miles away. Tell me about that Starbucks. goes on the Internet, brings that back. Uh, and in a minute, it'll get me a map. So, uh, and, and I can do more. I can, for example, uh, have full access to all kinds of media. So, here I've got full motion uh, video television that is recorded on the cell phone or could be streamed over the internet if I had access to a, a Wi Fi connection or a higher speed cellular connection. But this doesn't have to be the news, although this does provide through the internet global access to all of the world's video. It could be educational materials. So, you know, I get personally quite uh, excited about these kind of capabilities because I think that parents all over the world are quite interested in uh, getting their kids access. We'd like to find ways to, to help not just the, the rich world, but ultimately the middle class and, and the bottom of the pyramid globally to be able to use these technologies to further enhance the global economy and the, the global quality of life. And I think that this shows that we can do rapid innovation. Bill and I did an interview about this in January. Uh, our prototyping people have been able to get this running this much today. And, you know, we're, we're going to look at what it would take for us to bring that to market, uh, not just in a rich world cell phone, but ultimately even in lower uh, capability phones as they continue to evolve. So this uh, leads me on to sort of the last thing I want to talk a little bit about which is not new business models, new technology per se, but whole new markets. As I said, you know, I came here 14 years ago, and my first six years was essentially laying the foundation for Microsoft to have a position in virtually every form of intelligent consumer electronics. And today the businesses that you see us in, you know, are building on that long-term investment. Uh, when I look around the world today, clearly one of the things that every government, every country is struggling with are the money that is being spent on health care and education. If you look at this graph, it shows that uh, the range is from a low of about 20% to a high of about, in the U.S., 37% on the re most recently available numbers as a percentage of all government outlays that go into just these two categories. And yet nobody anywhere in the world is happy with the outcomes. And most of the world uh, don't actually have health care and education of any substantive uh, level of quality. And so it's pretty clear to me that, that this is a huge need and a huge opportunity. And so we, Steve and I and, and uh, Peter Newport, a couple of years ago decided we should begin to think about not just how does Microsoft sell its traditional technology to the people who are in the business of healthcare. How do we think about going beyond that? How do we think about using our research assets and our, uh, on our understanding of these technologies to think about what we could bring as value-added capability into these markets directly, and not just in the developed world, but in the developing world as well. So if you look at this, the two ovals represent, if you will, uh, what ultimately has to happen. Uh, the developed countries in green, today we have a fairly low number of people served per doctor, uh, and 
the, you know, we have reasonably comprehensive care, but everybody wants that to get a lot better. In the emerging markets, we have a big problem in that we, there's just no way, in my opinion, that we're going to see any economically viable or practical way of scaling rich world health care to meet the needs of those another 5 billion people. And only technology is going to deliver both the, the capability and the scaling to allow what we know today as rich world health care to, to be made available at some level to the rest of the planet. And so the question is, how, what are those technologies and what role could we play in it? Well, today, if you think about uh, even in the, in, in the United States or the G8 countries, how does computing apply to health care? The answer is not very well. It's been applied dramatically within the diagnostic side of the house, but it's really been applied very poorly uh, in, in almost every other aspect. And today, especially on the medical uh, data itself, what you really have is just completely isolated islands of information. You know, you can uh, apply some local interpretation or, or investigation, but it's very hard uh, to go well beyond that. And it's certainly, while everybody knows there's benefits, no one has really succeeded in integrating across these different diverse data sets. Uh, so, you know, our question to ourselves was what could we do uh, to facilitate this situation? And so the first step clearly is you have to get an electronic medical record. Uh, and there's lots of people who've been thinking about how to create a new canonical one. Uh, and if we had that and prospectively could put all the data in it, you know, that would get us going down the right path. But that looks like a, a pretty long-term uh, effort. On the other hand, uh, we ha have felt that a big part of the future of health is going to be based on the personal health record. And that ultimately, the real decisions that you want to make, the way you're going to empower the consumer as well as the healthcare professional, is to, is to bring together what the individual can contribute at a personal level, and consumer electronics and other things are going to contribute to this over the next few years, along with an institutional uh, uh, combination of all that information. And then the level of interpretation that can be done, supplemented by breakthrough technologies uh, like genomics and proteomics, which everybody agrees in, are essentially information technology-based medicine. These are the things that have the potential to revolutionize the medical environment. So one of the parts of our strategy has been to, to think, how do we get into this environment? How do we bring value uh, in the short term? And as Steve mentioned yesterday, we completed the acquisition of a technology called the Zixi, which is developed uh, uh, by Dr. Craig Faid and, and his colleagues at the Washington Medical Center, part of the MedStar hospital system. And it's been deployed there uh, for the last nine years uh, while it's been in development. So we completed uh, and announced this acquisition yesterday, and it's really the, f the first uh, public part that we're coming out with in our new business of, of taking Microsoft broadly into the health field. What I want to show you is why this is a little different than what people historically think about as this next step of getting to the electronic medical record. Much as the earlier demos showed, our dream is to be able to analyze and synthesize information out of what otherwise seemed to be a disparate collection of, of random uh, data. And the Azixi system was not only built as a set of sort of business intelligence connectors to all of the sources of both operational and clinical data in a hospital, it was also built to have uh, the capability to do this type of, of data analysis. So here's a, just a, a representation of a screenshot of what the raw medical record would be. The example I'm going to take you through of, of interpretation is one that Dr. Faid did. It was well known in the D.C. area that every so often there would be a spike of people who got sick, who had a, a severe gastric uh, distress. And it would come and go and come and go. And no one had for a long time been able to figure out why. So he decided, well, let's see if we could take our data and figure that out. So he took this data over a period of a year. He used one of the visualization tools that's embedded, built this graph in a matter of a few seconds, uh, realized that the blue bubbles were, were outbreaks of this, of this phenomena. And looking at it week by week, he, he was able to say, hmm, uh, let's take a zoom in on some of these weeks. So this is a new, another form of zooming in on the data. So they took a few of these things and looked at them and correlated it with a lot of external information. And interestingly, they found that, that these attacks corresponded to above average rainfall. And they said, mm, that's interesting, because it doesn't correlate that many other things. And so 
uh, they said, well, let's try to figure out what is it about these people that might, they might have in common. So they went to the records of addresses of all these people from all the hospitals, and they did a mashup on top of a, of a, a, a map. And lo and behold, they found that no matter what hospital these people showed up at, this is where they lived. And they all, except one case, they all lived uh, in one very tightly confined part of, of the district uh, in that part of Maryland, uh, and all on one side of one creek. So they actually, with the EPA and other people, went and did the study. To make a long story short, when it rained, there was one community whose uh, rainwater handling system would overflow. It happened to overflow into the sewage treatment plant. The sewage treatment plant then couldn't handle the volume of water, so it basically discharged sewage uh, instead of clean effluent out into that creek. It ran down the, the creek a little ways on that side of the river to what happened to be the inlet for the next town's water supply. At that point, the, the bacterial content was higher than those systems are designed for, so the bacteria flowed through that system a little bit and into the water supply. And those people got up and brushed their teeth in the morning and, you know, ingested the bacteria, and then they went to work. And after they got to work, they got sick. And then they went to the hospital they were closest to. So only the ability to mine all this stuff together and do this type of deep data analysis produces this kind of capability. So this is just one instance of the kind of things that we think we can do, where we're adding value on top of what people historically have been doing in trying to add uh, electronic medical records to these systems. And, but we think that this is paradigmatic of what will happen as we now try to move toward personalized medicine, the ability to take this incredible uh, rich environment of proteomic and genomic data and, and bring this forward into a new world of healthcare. And if we can do this in conjunction with things like that phone that can be your television uh, or these other non-textual ways of searching and discovering information, we think we can do great things, not only for our business in terms of people's interest in acquiring this technology and deploying it, but ultimately for society because we may in fact be at the heart of the technology change that would allow us to give health care and education not just to the billion richest people on the planet, uh, but perhaps as a significant part, if not ultimately all, of, of the people on the planet. So when you look at this and you look back over the, the, the years, I want to show that we have been very, very systematic in building up the capability to keep you coming back every year. And that we are in, in and we're doing that now and we'll continue to do it in the future. Uh, everybody knows about Windows and Office. As I said, those things took a lot longer to come uh, to the fore than people realize. But years ago, I mean, Kevin uh, Johnson, who's the president of the Platforms Division, said in a comment the other day uh, that his first job, I think it was in 1994, was participating in the launch of Windows NT. Windows NT was developed so that Microsoft could enter the enterprise software business. And today, Bob Muglia got up with him and said, hey, you know, we're a factor in enterprise software. You know, we have a huge and growing franchise in the fastest growing segment of that business, which is, which is the Server 2003 technology, and that's the direct descendant of that capability. Um, as I said, I started back in the early, the mid-1990s doing Pocket PC, Windows CE. We started MSN back there in 1994, 1995. Uh, we built and bought Hotmail. Uh, all these things are, we're creating the underlying capability, the learning, that muscle that allows the company to both respond and to innovate. Things like Blaze showed you, I think, are where we're bringing these long-term assets quickly now through these kind of technologies and bringing them out. And, of course, uh, it was a little, uh, uh, quite a while ago, we, we did Xbox and television. And so all these things are the ones that you kind of focus on and see. But if you think about where we really are today, this is really the, gra the, the graph I think about. And this meeting mostly, importantly, talks about the things that are in the two rightmost columns. They're the ones that are out there. They're becoming profitable. They're the big franchises. But if you look at the depth of the pipeline that this company has and the investments we continue to make in order to, to be prepared for that future, whether it's a technological adaptation, a market adaptation, uh, or a competitive adaptation, you know, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a company that has systematically prepared for the future the way that we have and the way that we intend to continue to do. And so the new things that I'm incubating, education, healthcare, pay-as-you-go computing, uh, technical computing, which was essentially its first genesis was uh, alluded to today in Bob's remarks about high-performance computing, the compute cluster server. 
Uh, we, we basically assembled that capability, even though it was a business we'd never been in. And today we think we're going to be a player in that, the emerging markets. Uh, recently this year, probably didn't get on your radar screen, but we actually uh, put up on the web for free the first access for, for students and, and interested parties to Microsoft's first robotics software development kit. So we've been developing some fundamentally new technology we think could revolutionize the way that people use robotics or develop robotic systems. And while that's not a big factor in our business today, it could be a very important factor in the future. So I'm very happy and proud to be a part of the company. I think that we will continue to have a great partnership between the long cycle innovation people in the company, which I will manage and continue to drive, as I have with Bill for the last eight years, and the great execution that turns those, uh, th those strategies into business performance as opposed to hallucination, as Kevin said. And I think that the company is going to have a great future. Thank you very much.